Tucker Carlson interviewing Vladimir Putin. Blew up Nord Stream. <laughs> you for sure. I was busy that day. <laughs> Nate, it, do you have, do you have, <laughs> uh, I did not blow up Nord Stream. Uh, <laughs> thank you, though. <laughs> you personally may have an alibi, but the CIA has no such alibi. Oh, yeah, you see. And this is what I've, I've said. Ain't from the very, that hurtful. And what I've said from the very beginning is that the blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline is what turned what could have ended within a number of weeks to something that now is a quagmire for many, many years. Because what's and who what's is the most going? obvious person to do that? The Central Intelligence Agency. No, I mean, I was just talking in terms of countries. Oh, of course. Well, that's what I mean. Which country is most likely to do that? Well, even if it, I, even if it is, <laughs> even if it is technically Ukraine, nothing is being done without our assistance. Of course not. That's why this whole thing about when you think about hundreds of billions of dollars, it's types of money that you can't wrap your mind around. Ukraine you is not doing this on their own. They're not figuring it out. They're not capable. Don't be absurd. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you have evidence that NATO or the CIA did it? You know, I won't get into details, but people always say in such cases, look for someone who is interested. But in this case, we should not only look for someone who is interested, but also for someone who has capabilities. Because there may be many people interested, but not all of them are capable of sinking to the bottom of the Baltic Sea and carrying out this explosion. <laughs> These two components should be connected. Who is interested and who is capable of doing it? But I'm confused. I mean, that's the biggest act of industrial terrorism ever. And therein lies the rub, and Tucker's absolutely right about this. You can't have an environmental movement in this country led by somebody who isn't even from here, like Greta Thunberg, and not say a single word about <laughs> the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline. It's the biggest ecological disaster in the history of the world, and it's not close. Okay, so this is the first time I've ever listened to Putin, and I know Very it's not his voice. Because no, that's what, no, no, you no, can no, hear no, Putin no. speak. Yes, no, no, no. What I mean is, it's the first time I ever listened to him in any capacity. So, from that, so what he's saying is, you look to the person who has the most to gain and the capability to pull it off. So this means that this is an individual using reason. And what's fascinating is that how fast somebody like Hillary would discount a statement that is the most logical, reasonable type of thing to say about anything. Can I just point out what a, what a listen, I know Tucker Carlson is tall, but he looks like a giant. Uh, well, I just said to you, Tucker Carlson's really tall, but obviously Putin is small. Oh, my God. Oh, Putin. Oh, poor guy. He needs, he needs, he needs. hear any of the commentary about that. I was just going to say pants for him. The pants, the pants are too short. Yes, they're a little too short. Okay. And it's the largest emission of CO2 in, in history. Okay, so if you had evidence, and presumably given your security services, your intel services, you would, that NATO, the U.S., CIA, the West did this, why wouldn't you present it and win a propaganda victory? <laughs> In the war of propaganda, it is very difficult to defeat the United States because the United States controls all the world's media and many European media. The ultimate beneficiary of the biggest European media are American financial institutions. Don't you know that? So it is possible to get involved in this work but it is cost prohibitive, so to speak. We can simply shine the spotlight on our sources of information and we will not achieve results. It is clear to the whole world what happened and even American analysts talk about it directly. It's true. Yes. I, so I just want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding what you're saying. I don't think that I am. I think you're saying you want a negotiated settlement to what's happening in Ukraine. And I'm sure that that is the case. He tried. Like, the, the, he actually tried before invading Ukraine to deal with this. Again, I, I, I'm still not seeing how, how anything about him is unreasonable. And yet okay. the scary part is, 
there really is this idea of American exceptionalism that a lot of people still don't recognize that they have within their DNA. They still think that everything we do is completely acceptable, <clears throat> that we can just run roughshod over the entire world, and that the second that when you do this and then the person hits back, it's, oh my God, why the hell would you do that? Well, and just so, so American centric, centric and how we think about things. And it's just a point of reference. Like, I don't know if people remember like that we used to, we used to, when I was little, the term Oriental was, was wrong. acceptable. Well, it was acceptable. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't considered rude. Um, it was considered acceptable. And if you ever look up the word Orient, which is how we always refer to obviously Asia as the Orient, it has to do with we are the center and they're oriented over there. So, let's so well, just that it's centered around us and they're oriented over there, even our language and how we talk about um, other continents, other people is very, very diminutive. And when when he's sitting there and saying that, I actually can almost as somebody who actually comes from Russian people, my family, I'm like, I want to say three quarters like Russian um, many generations ago. I, I don't. But like when I hear him talk about this sort of American and Western European hegemony that he has to deal with, I can get that. Like I feel that. And as Russians feeling that sort of level of being condescended to and demeaned and always stuck to. And we really have no idea what the rest of the world says about it. I do because I particularly look for it, but we're not told. We, the entire world believes that we did what he's saying we did. Yeah, that's the truth. They all do. They all believe that America blew up the pipeline. <laughs> right. And we made it. We prepared a huge document in Istanbul that was initialed by the head of the Ukrainian delegation. He affixed his signature to some of the provisions, not to all of it. He put his signature and then he himself said, we were ready to sign it and the war would have been over long ago, 18 months ago. However, Prime Minister Johnson came, talked us out of it and we missed that chance. Well, you missed it, you made a mistake, let them get back to that, that is all. A coup d'etat was committed, although I shall not delve into details now, as I find doing it inappropriate, the US told us. Calm Yanukovych down and we will calm the opposition. Let the situation unfold in the scenario of a political settlement. We said, all right, agreed, let's do it this way. As the Americans requested, Yanukovych did use neither the armed forces nor the police, Yet the armed opposition committed a coup in Kiev. What is that supposed to mean? Who do you think you are? I wanted to ask the then US leadership. With the back. We just cannot stay out of everybody's business. It's truly unbelievable. So and don't think for a second that Prime Minister Boris Johnson <laughs> was not working on the behest of the United States State Department. And by the way, this story story this this narrative this version is exactly tracks what is in medea benjamin's book it tracks if you were to sit there and piece together the timing of like minsk agreement minsk 2 agreement prior to this before the invasion the conversations the negotiations and then the sabotaging that has happened both from the uk and from us in terms of then settling this. And that's where, when we had the conversation with Dylan Burns and he says, I don't take uh, into consideration what Medea Benjamin Not just say. her, but it's like, like that's, you, it's, you it's just basically, if you have to document a whole history there and it's what he's saying is, is accurate. It's like, I, I don't well, understand. And, and we'll break it down afterwards, but it's like the whole, it's equating what happened on October 7th with all of a sudden the, uh, you know, Hamas just decided that they were right. just going to attack. They broke the, I love yeah. this, 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 they broke the, the ceasefire. ceasefire, even though 700 Palestinians had already been murdered that <laughs> okay, year. First of all, yeah, the, there was never a ceasefire because, well, first of all, it shouldn't ever be called a ceasefire because it's not a war. It's not two factions. It's a, it's a genocide and it's shooting fish in a barrel. But yeah, there's no ceasefire. I don't, it's the same thing with this. There was this, ample opportunity for this to resolve without death and destruction prior to Russia's invasion. And yet 
we didn't do that. I wonder why. But the 11, it just as Hillary Clinton said, the 11 intelligence agencies said, no, that's not how it happened. Putin just decided to attack and we have to do something. About it. Except it isn't just intelligence agencies. I have been looking into this like since this happened enough, yeah. like reading enough, researching, listening to professors and experts and people. Yeah, this is what happened. There was ample opportunity to settle this prior to any of this happening. That's for sure. King of whom? With the backing of CIA, of course. The organization you wanted to join back in the day, as I understand. <laughs> we should thank God they didn't let you in. Although, it is a serious organization. I understand. My former vis-a-vis -vis in the sense that I served in the first main directorate, Soviet Union's intelligence service. They have always been our opponents. A job is a job. I appreciate all the time uh, you've given us. I just gotta ask you one last question, and that's about someone who's very famous in the United States, probably not here, Evan Gershkovitz, who's the Wall Street Journal reporter. He's 32, um, and he's been in prison for almost a year. Uh, this is a huge story in the United States, and I just wanna ask you directly, without getting into the details of it or your version of what happened, if as a sign of your decency, you would be willing to release him to us and we'll bring him back to the United States. That's balls. That's balls. Yeah. Wow. <sighs> okay. Um, uh, before he even continues, the fact that Tucker had the gall to ask it. He just asked Ooh. Vladimir Putin to release somebody. Like, that's, we can't even First get interviewers even like to that. push back a little bit on shit. And he just asked for the release and don't of, forget, of a he's a he's political making, prisoner. He's asking this question. Wow. Inside the Kremlin. He's asking it inside the fortress. That's balls. That takes a lot of guts, man. <laughs> That, is, that a, is a lot of guts to do that. I, I mean, I don't know what they had pre-planned or not. Like, I don't know what was okay to ask. We don't know. Like, for all I know, they looked at it and said, okay, fine, you can ask that. I just know. the one thing you can say but about if, it, if there's, right, if like, there's one know. thing you could say about Tucker Carlson, and here's the big difference between his, because he is, in terms of who is the most popular political figure in the MAGA movement outside of Trump, it is definitely him. It's not, he's number two. But here's the difference between him and Trump. Tucker, <laughs> genuinely, from what I've seen, he's not motivated by the money. Well, he's, already, no. he's already got a ton of it. Trump is motivated by money and power. A lot of them are all motivated well, Trump, by Well, Trump's not motivated by more and more money as much as playing the money game and power. But I don't think that's Tucker's thing. Tucker really... I think he's elitist is all get out. Absolutely, 100%. But the fact that he... Ask that question. I haven't even heard the response yet. But no, I want to let you do that. That's ballsy. It is very, very ballsy. Yeah. Sure. Oh, did you screw it up? I did, but I will fix it. And, and that's about someone who's very famous in the United States, probably not here, Evan Gershkovitz, the Wall Street Journal. And I just want to okay. ask you directly, yeah. without getting into the details of it or your version of what happened, if as a sign of your decency, you would be willing to release him to us and we'll bring him back to the United States. We have done so many gestures of goodwill we have done so many gestures of goodwill out of decency that I think we have run out of them. No. We have never seen anyone reciprocate to us in a similar manner. However, in theory, we can say that we do not rule out that we can do that if our partners take reciprocal steps. Okay, so when I talk about the partners, I first of all refer to special services. Special services are in contact with one another. They are talking about the matter in question. <clears throat> well, I don't know him again. I don't know him enough to say that you would take that at face value or take his word that he would be willing to discuss it if they would, if we would show a gesture. And I agree. There's chance. I I have no doubt that. Oh, awesome, awesome, Teresa. I have no doubt. Don't do that one. In the middle of the thing. <laughs> that, see, then I lose it. Yeah, then I lose it. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't remember now. See, you do remember. I kind of don't. Yeah, you do. I really don't. Oh, about Putin. What was we, we were talking about? Putin. 
that he would actually make an exchange. Well, and maybe he would, maybe he's lying, maybe he wouldn't. Um, but I have no doubt that what he's saying about that even if they were to make gestures, they don't ever get it reciprocated. That I believe. That I believe. I believe that because we have a country wherein apparently the president is not capable of overruling the deep state. So if you have a president that says something like, I don't know, Obama said, I'm going to close down Guantanamo Bay, and yet there it still sits. So clearly you weren't able to do that. So when we talk about releasing political prisoners, my thought goes to clearly the president doesn't really even have control of that situation. Certainly not in this country. So I don't blame him for not trusting any sort of reciprocation on anything. And I really have no concept as to what Russian people we have in in political incarcerated here. I don't. I don't know anything about our po political prisoner Russia. No, but there's exchange. a lot of things that we do not know about and we're not allowed to know about because the average American thinks mm -hmm. that they're informed and the truth is they're either uninformed or ill-informed. We could bring on someone who is informed because I know sure. a few people that would know the answers to these questions. But I would definitely say that I bet, I bet Ray McGovern would know. I bet yeah. John Kiriakou would know yeah. the answers yeah. to these, some of these yeah. questions. And I would say that probably the biggest reason that they didn't want this interview to go is because they do not want Putin and the Russians to be shown in a human light nope. in any capacity. No, because he came off very reasonable. He did. And part of the reason he comes off reasonable is because Putin has always, he's always played his hand with an ace in the hole. You want to know what has. I think? I think that if you were to show him enough times between now and November, you could get enough people to write him in. Truthfully. Yeah, I'm not. He comes yeah. off infinitely more competent than Biden does. Like, I'm saying, like, he's sitting, he at least comes off like a competent person. So I'm just saying, it's like, if you're going to be showing us clips of Joe and Trump, if you were to sprinkle Putin in there, enough people would probably write him in and think he's valid. Certainly uh, one of the more memorable moments Jesus. when everybody was losing their minds back in 2017, 2018, when Trump and Putin finally met face to face. You know, one thing that uh, gets overlooked is that Trump was the first person to extend his hand to Putin to shake his hand. And they Putin, hated that. Putin was, sh Putin was waiting there. He wasn't going to do it. He's like, oh, OK, I guess I'll shake it now. That's it's all psychological warfare. That's all that is. And that's all it's ever been. It's not about whether Putin's right or wrong. Most people don't know and they don't care. Can I tell they you, their this team, is one of those team. things. This is one of those things that you wouldn't have, I don't think, with women. This particular type of, of like pissing match thing. I don't think so. I don't think that I, I, I just don't see it that way. Like that whole description you just had. I'm like, if that were two women, I just no. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.